Let's talk about Franz Hals's Officers of the St. Hadrian Civic Guild to help us understand what's happening with art in the Dutch Republic during the 17th century. The first thing we can notice here is the type of subject that we're looking at, which is a group portrait. And one of the things we want to remember is that there were a lot of middle class patrons in the Dutch Republic during that golden age of the 17th century. And they were really wealthy, right? This was a rising middle class and some of them were becoming like mind bogglingly wealthy. And that made portraits very popular. People wanted to memorialize themselves. People wanted to have a portrait as a sign of their newfound social status. And we have to remember too, that portraits also really appealed to this Protestant context within the Dutch Republic. They didn't always want biblical subject matter. In fact, that was pretty rare for them to want biblical subject matter. So these secular types of subjects were really popular in the 17th century. Group portraits um, could include family groups. It could include a club, which is essentially kind of what we're looking at here with this militias guild. Um, it could be a charitable group. There were all sorts of different options we could have for group portraits. And this one in particular was done for a civic guard in Harlem known as the Civic Guard of, the, of St. Hadrian. It was originally meant to be hung publicly. So this was something that people, uh, just in the general populace, especially other businessmen, would have seen very often. So when we talked about portraiture as being a mark of your social status, understanding how this particular portrait would have been displayed helps us to understand even how strongly it would have communicated the social status of those that are pictured in the group portrait. Here you can see a print from the late 1700s showing the painting in situ. It was originally meant to hang in the Harlem Guild Hall, and it's a building that's now the public library. Individuals would have paid according to their position and their prominence for these types of portraits. And in fact, that is one of the origins of that phrase, going Dutch, if you've ever heard that before, where you pay for your own portion. These figures are all identified. Uh, we can see quite a bit of emphasis and attention given to the two captains of the Civic Guard. We have Captain Johan Schotter, and he's the one with this magnificent blue sash with the bow standing in the front of the table, looking out toward us, towards the center of the work. We also see Captain Andries van Hoorn, and he's also standing in front. He's to the right of Captain Schotter. He's the one with the orange sash with also an elaborate bow. He's looking at us as well. Uh, so these two figures would have been the most prominent types of position in the guard themselves. And that prominence is really being communicated through the composition. One thing that's kind of interesting to know is that they're shown banqueting instead of like preparing for battle or fighting. And really these civic guards actually had a role in fighting and protecting cities earlier on in the 80 years war. But at this point of the Eighty Years' War, they didn't really have very many actual responsibilities. They little, they very little had any sort of defense um, responsibilities given to them, and they were more like social clubs. So this becomes a real statement of security and of the prosperity of the Dutch Republic on the whole. So it doesn't just propagandize these individuals and their social class, but it also says something about the political situation in the Dutch Republic. They don't need to defend their cities because they're peaceful cities. Most of the fighting of the Eighty Years' War is happening in Flanders. They don't need to fight themselves because they're wealthy enough to hire mercenaries. So this simple kind of subject of them banqueting rather than fighting is actually pretty significant. Throughout the work, we can see quite a few Baroque elements in terms of style. We can see that Franz Hals is aware of those Utrecht Caravagisti, those artists who were able to travel to Italy because of their Catholic um, religion. They were protected and safe to make that trip and brought back so many of Caravaggio's elements of the Baroque style. One of the things we see really right off is how the Utrecht Caravagisti followed Caravaggio's emphasis on viewer involvement. And that's definitely a part of many other Baroque styles. But here we can see some specific uh, tendencies and specific tools that Caravaggio and thus the Utrecht Caravaggisti used. So we have a lot of eye contact, for instance. We have a lot of foreshortening, things coming right out to our space. We see the figures are cropped, right? We don't see the entirety of all of the figures, but many of them are cropped, like we're so close, we can't even see them all at once. And they're brought really close to the picture plane. If we could reach through the surface of the painting, we could touch a lot of these people. All of that makes us feel like we are in the proximity, we are in the space of this work. It's very viewer involving. It involves us also, just like Caravaggio and like the Utrecht Caravaggisti, through illusion. 
things look really believable. Uh, the naturalistic kinds of touches, which Franz Hall is able to achieve with like actually pretty abstract brushwork are fantastically convincing. Another thing that he's doing here that's very much like Caravaggio is his figure type. And this is something we see used throughout the Dutch Republic all the time, the unidealized naturalistic portrayal of human subjects and human figures. These aren't figures that look like a titanic muscle bodybuilding um, idealized men like Rubens might portray, but instead they look like normal everyday dudes. And uh, those unidealized figures are a huge component to the way Caravaggio approached the Baroque style and something that the Utrecht Caravaggisti bring back to the Dutch. And we see many Dutch artists following after the same trends. You can see a couple of other things here that involve us as viewers. And there's some that are really um, kind of more specific to Franz Hall's we have this sense of vivacity, exuberance, spontaneity. This whole work seems like it is full of life. And part of that is due to the technique that Franz Hals uses, this alla prima approach. So he does very little underdrawing, but he just kind of approaches the canvas and just executes. And this is something that's actually really would be more difficult than taking the time to work your composition out step by step and then using that final approach in your actual work. But instead, Halls is able to just work that out as he goes. And I think that that is a real talent that he had. So this all a prima approach combined with his painterly brushwork that sometimes has some impasto really creates this mood where we look at the work and we feel rhythm, we feel life. We don't feel like it's calm, cool, and collected like a Renaissance work, but we feel like it's just full of this kind of impending sense of action. Halls is great at doing a lot of naturalistic touches. Caravaggio did that. Artists in the Dutch Republic continue to do that. That's part of their Northern heritage. So we see um, you know, a sense of atmosphere and light and movement, and Halls often achieves that through daubing, and that's really pretty characteristic of him as well and adds to the sense of illusion. He's using um, diagonals, he's using kind of compositional tools that seem very active and vibrant. That too keeps us feeling like this is an exciting work. This is something that Halls is wonderful at achieving. Instead of a group portrait with two people just lined up, which is pretty boring, Halls is able to create the senses that we've just walked into the room and we have come into this overflowing conversation that's happening between all these individuals. They're right in the middle of enjoying themselves. Uh, it's almost as though we can kind of hear the, the level of their involvement in their party as we look at the work. Halls achieves too a great sense of psychology with these figures and that's something that he is known for. The sense of character, the sense of individuality that he captures through dress, through gesture, through features is really pretty fantastic. There's one more thing that we haven't pointed out yet that adds to the sense of involvement for us as viewers, and that's the dramatic lighting. So Halls is using here some tenebrism, some pretty stark contrasts of light and dark. These figures are brightly lit. They're against a fairly dark background. It brings a lot of emphasis to them, but also adds a kind of sense of excitement to the work. Along with Rembrandt, Franz Halls will be one of the most successful artists with group portraits. He, in his ability to capture the sense of the individuals, the sense of the dynamics of the group is really unparalleled. Rembrandt will be, I think, a close second. Some people might argue for the other way around. Hopefully though, now you understand the importance of group portraiture in this work, how it relates to the Dutch Republic in the context of the day, and how this shows the style of many Dutch artists, specifically through the style of Franz Hals.